Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Block Hall Church. My name is Pastor Sean. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so excited that you're with us in person and online this morning at our 8.30 service. A couple of items for you before we begin. If you're in the building, we have uh, little sheets of paper in the pews that have a QR code on them. If you're online, we have a slide that will show you that QR code. We are experimenting, rolling out digital bulletins. Simply scan that code with your phone's camera. A link will pop up. Click on that and it'll take you to our weekly newsletter as well as our bulletins for our 8.30 and our 10. You can also see the weekly email there as well and fill out an online connection card if you would as well, please. Also, we'll let you know our Bible studies are continuing on July the 26th. Our Monday night study will resume. Brian Masiak leads that serve, uh, study for us. They will be diving into a Wesleyan study of the book of Romans. Uh, it'll be a wonderful study. That we've got a list of the topics. If you want to see what they're go what's going on in that study, you can sign up at church. You can send an email to Brian or contact the church office, and we will put you in touch with Brian. We would love to have more folks at our Monday night study beginning on July 26th. The following day, on July 27th, we are going to be having our first covered dish dinner here at Buckhall Church in quite some time. The folks from For Children's Sake will be here to talk about the ministry and their program that they have supporting foster care children in the Northern Virginia area. This is the group we sponsor with our June Mission Project. We will be supporting them again in August with a backpack ministry. So we're looking forward to opening up our relationship and continuing that with them and invite you to join us on July the 27th for that dinner at 6.30 and the speakers at 7.15. And finally, a reminder that our July needs for our food pantry for St. Thomas Church are toothpaste, dish soap, paper towels, and toilet paper. Bring those in by the end of the month, and we will send them over to the food pantry at St. Thomas, and they are very grateful for all of your continued support of their wonderful food pantry ministry. Let us have a time of prayer, and then I will invite Brian to lead us in our call to worship and our psalm reading this morning. Gracious and heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the ability to be gathered together today in person and online. I pray that your spirit would move in a mighty way wherever we are, and that we would be drawn closer to you through our worship this morning. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brian? Please join me in the call to worship. People of God, open your ears. Come and celebrate the story of our God. A story of compassion and mercy, of redemption and love. A story passed down from generation to generation. So that God's people never forget the wonderful things our God has done. Let's praise God together. Our psalm reading today is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden from of old, things we have heard and known, things our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob, and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them. Even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. They would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. I invite you to join us in our opening hymn this morning. The words will be on the screen. Hymn number 454, Open My Eyes That I May See. shall unclasp and set me free. 
silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see, open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine, open my ears that I may hear, voices of truth thou send. fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my heart. Spirit divine. Let us pray. Gracious God, I give you thanks for your word. Your word broken open in scripture, and the word, your son, Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our rock and our redeemer. As we continue this morning in our single sermon series of just one-off sermons, I'm going to start off the very top with an observation that I have learned in the last 10 years of my life. No matter what generation you are a part of, whether you're a builder, whether you're a baby boomer, a Gen Xer, a millennial, or a Gen Zer, what I've learned is that every generation needs every generation. We are part of the body of Christ, and I think every generation is represented online or in person today. We need one another. We need each other to keep the faith moving. We all need one another. And this is a perfect example of what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 78, which we just heard. I'm going to remind you of those words we heard just a few minutes ago. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders He has done. Now, here's the deal. When we think of the next generation, regardless of what generation we find ourselves in, a lot of times the thought process is, I just don't relate to them, especially if we get more than one generation away from us. My life has been so much different than that, their life in that generation. Think about this, Generation Z, the young people who aren't so young necessarily, but folks who were born after the year 2000, who, by the way, can drink this year. Think about that for a second. That generation has never known the world without the Internet. They've never known the world without the internet. And if you have kids who are part of this generation, and my two little ones are a part of that generation, it's a reality. It's so hard to explain to them like, why we don't have Wi-Fi when we go some places. They just don't understand, but that's the reality. But the psalmist doesn't say you have to text or instant message the praiseworthy deeds of Jesus to the next generation. He says, I will utter things from of old. These are the things that are known, that we have known for generations. They're the praiseworthy deeds that God has done in our lives and that God is continuing to do. And you and I, as Christ followers, we, are, we need to pass those things on to the next generation, regardless of what generation we find ourselves in. The psalmist is keeping these praiseworthy deeds of God moving. But I want to pause there for just a moment 
And I want to get personal because, I'll be honest, this is something that I have struggled with. I served in youth ministry for many years. And a lot of times I didn't tell teenagers about the praiseworthy deeds of God. I would try to, but more often than not, I spent my time saying, knock it off, stop doing that. That's not how we behave in church. And unfortunately, the church gets a bad rap because we as Christ followers, we spend too much time focusing on what God is against rather than what God is for. And don't get me wrong, God is against sin, but God is also for us. He's for grace, he's for love, he's for his praiseworthy deeds. And sometimes we, and again, I'm guilty of this too, we get so focused on what God is against instead of what God is for. We don't get focused on his praiseworthy deeds. Pastor Andy Stanley of North Point Church in Atlanta once said this, Imagine a world where unbelievers were critical of what we believe, but envious of how, we, how well we treated one another. Imagine a world where unbelievers were critical of what we say we believe, but envious of how well we treat each other, how well we love one another, how well, well we share the praiseworthy deeds of God. Friends, I think if we did that, we can, Christianity would be absolutely contagious in our communities and in our world. And here's the deal. We have a challenge in our community. We have an opportunity in our community. And yes, we are streaming beyond to anybody in the world who wants to watch this, but in our immediate neighborhood, the latest survey from Mission Insight discovered that 54.5% of people who live in Prince William County, Manassas City, and Manassas Park, 54.5% of the people living there do not have a church home. 54.5% don't have a congregation or community of faith. And yet, to put that into perspective, that's 284,650 people who don't have a church home and don't know the love of Christ. Now, we can respond to that in, in two ways. We can hang our heads and just say, man, that's a horrible thing. People just don't love Jesus anymore. Or we can turn around and say what a fantastic opportunity that is to keep the message of Jesus moving in our community. And I believe that that's a great opportunity that we have to pass along our faith to the next generation. I believe down to my very toes that for us to stop and to combat the downward spiral of Christianity in our community and in our nation, you know what it's going to take? It's going to take seasoned Christian men and women to mentor the next generation, to build them up, to share the praiseworthy deeds of God, to keep the faith moving. And in our ever-increasing virtual world, where we can connect with someone across the globe in a matter of seconds, we as people are more disconnected than we've ever been. We desire authentic, real relationships, our souls crave that real relationship. And that's why, friends, I think if we're going to step up and if we're going to step up to this awesome opportunity, that we need to have folks who are willing to not just leave a legacy for the next generation, to not just leave a mark, to not just leave an impression for the next generation. If you were to interview me, if I made it to 100 years old, God willing, I make it that long in life, and say, what, Sean, what does it mean to have a life worth living? I would say, I don't, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't want to leave a mark. I want to leave a blessing. I want to be able to leave something that will last for eternity, whether my name is attached to it or not. I want to have an impact on someone's life. And so the big question we need to answer today is this, how can I live a life of blessing? How can I live a life that blesses the next generation, regardless of what generation I'm in? And we're going to take a sweep through a wide swath of Scripture this morning to answer this question and see what God has in store for us. The first thing we need to do to live a life of blessing is this. I need to look back. I need to look back. There are many times in our lives where it's necessary quite frankly, to look back. We look back at old pictures, at wedding albums, at family home videos, old movies, listen to old songs that bring up memories. And oftentimes, we will even go back to places that have special meaning in our lives. 
And when we do that, people start to pop up in our minds. And a lot of times, these people are the ones who had the biggest influence on our lives. So let me ask you this, and if you have paper with you, write it down. If you have your phone, make a note in your phone. Who was that person when you were younger who influenced your life? Who made a difference in your life? Maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was a teacher, a coach, a, an aunt, an uncle, a pastor. Who was that person? Write that name down or hold that name in your head. And maybe jot down a couple of reasons. Think about a couple of reasons how that person impacted your life. Those relationships are so special because of the influence they've had on us. Because of the impact they've had on shaping our lives. And we're going to take a sweep of scripture. We're going to start in the Old Testament. And we see a perfect example of looking back in Moses' life. He led the Israelites out of Egypt and now they're wandering the desert. And Moses has been declared judge of all the people for all of their disputes. Bear in mind, there are about two million of these Israelites. So Moses was a little burdened. He was exhausted. He was worn out. And he got a great piece of advice from his father-in-law, Jethro. And we'll see this here in Exodus 18. This is what it says. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. See, someone with more life experience than Moses spoke words of truth into Moses' life. He didn't cut them down. He didn't beat them down. He lifted Moses up. He empathized with Moses, and he gave words of wisdom. And this is how Moses responds. Moses listened to everything his father-in-law said and did everything he said. It's one thing to just hear somebody maybe just throwing advice at you. But it's another thing to listen, to respond, and to follow through and do what they say. This shows that mentor relationship, shows mutual respect, and we all need this. You know, our world really values and puts people up on pedestals who are superstars in sports or entertainment or politics or innovation. But I, I want to prove a point here to you this morning who are the people that really make a difference in your life and mine? My hunch is it's not Tom Brady. It's the men and women who are humble enough to spend hours and hours and hours with us. Think about this. Can you name the Super Bowl MVP from 11 years ago? Can you name the best actor or actress from the Oscar Awards 11 years ago? Can you name who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009? Most people can't. But can you name the person or persons who influenced you, who shaped your life as a young person? I bet you can. Why? Because those people left a blessing. They left a blessing. A, a legacy, you see, is a stagnant picture of who we were at some point in our lives, of what we've accomplished. But a blessing keeps moving. And this is what I want you to do. That, that name we thought about a few minutes ago, I want you to, if it's possible, find a way this week to contact that person. Write them a note, call them, text them, write them a letter, whatever you need to do. If you're able to do that, contact that person and thank them for what they did. If that person has gone on to greater things and you have their family, you know their family, contact their family. And then this week, also spend time in prayer thanking God for that person, for how they have shaped you. Why is it important to look back? Because it helps us and it reminds us that we have been filled. We have been poured into. And then in turn, we need to pour into others. So that's number one. How do we lead a life of blessing? We need to look back. Number two is this. We need to look up. It's important for us to continually 
find people in our lives that will pour into us, that will mentor us, that will shape us, that will keep us on the straight and narrow, who will pour their wisdom into us. And here's the thing about looking up. That person doesn't have to be older than you. It's more about character than it is about age. We're doing this sweep of Scripture, and we find this in the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. When the angel Gabriel came to her and said she was going to give birth to the Son of God, she was terrified and shocked, and rightly so. But though she was terrified and shocked, she knew who she needed to go to. She ran to the home of her older cousin, Elizabeth. We read this, we find this in Luke chapter 1, and this is what it says. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Mary hurries to her cousin's home. Why? Why didn't she go to her parents, her grandparents, her neighbor, her fiancé? Well, the truth is she was pregnant and not married, and she could have been stoned for that. So she needed to go to someone she trusted, her older cousin who had wisdom. And when she got there, Elizabeth blessed her. And Scripture tells us that Mary stayed there for three more months. I I tend to think that what Mary needed, God knew that Mary needed a mentor. God knew that Mary needed somebody to look up to. And in a moment of joy, who is that person that you celebrate with? In moments of anxiety, who is that person who will mourn with you or bring you peace? When life is too hard to bear, who is the person that will bear it with you? No questions asked. I've had that person in my life. I've had several people who filled that role in my life. But one of those people is my good friend, Benson. Benson has been a friend of mine for five years or so. He's a pastor just up the road. We text and we call and we talk all the time, and we also do a podcast together called the Free Range Church Podcast, Shameless Self-Promotion. Go check that out anywhere you find podcasts. But why is that relationship with Benson so important to me? Benson speaks in truth and in love. He's not afraid to tell me how it is. We talk about the deep stuff of life, and he cares about my soul. He cares about my wife. He cares about my kids. But you know what else Benson does? He blesses me. Blessing is simply saying good words over someone. And here's the kicker. Benson is younger than I am. It's not about age. It's about character. And I have this belief, this world that we live in, that is so critical of everyone. Where social media, people can hide behind profile pictures and and avatars. And they throw insults and words at anyone and everyone. I believe that our world is craving a blessing for good words, authentic good words. We want to hear people speak good words over us to build us up, and it's so vital that we have that person in our lives. So who is that person for you? Write that name down. Hold that person in your head. Now, you may be thinking, I don't have that person. I don't know who that is. Pray about it. Maybe God will put a name on your heart. Maybe God will stir something in your soul and nudge you to make a phone call, to send a text, send an email, make contact with someone and simply ask them, hey, can we spend some time together this week? I need to have someone in my life who's going to build me up, who will speak truth in love to my life. So that's number two. How do we leave a life of blessing? We look up. Number three is this. We need to look around. We need to look around us. My kids love to go swimming. They can't quite swim on their own yet, but they love being in water. One of my favorite parts, though, of any time we get to go to a pool or go anywhere that I can do this is this moment. And that's not me, just for clarification. Is that moment when you jump off and you throw a big cannonball into the pool. We all know that feeling. You see somebody doing it and you run for cover so you don't get splashed. But we all know what happens when you land in that pool and you make that big splash. What do the waves do? They smash out to the side of the pool. And I think our faith is a lot like that. Here's what I mean. When courageous men and women of faith, when they jump into the ocean of God's grace, the ripples go out farther and farther than we could ever see. It's called the ripple effect. We know about this. 
When someone invests in the life of another individual, they invest in the life of the next person. We see this in Scripture where Paul is writing a letter to his spiritual son, Timothy, whom he adores. And he says this in 2 Timothy or sorry, in uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He says, You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Paul says, You've seen me, you've heard me teach about these trustworthy things that God has laid on my heart. And he's passing them on to Timothy. And Paul says, Timothy, now you need to go take this and pass it on to the next person. And then they will pass it on to the next person. There's a real life example of this that happened about 120 years ago, or started about 120 years ago. I'm going to share that with you this morning. Some of these names may sound familiar to you. This ripple effect of faith. A gentleman by the name of Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. Not a pastor, not a clergy, but a Sunday school teacher who deeply cared for the young men and women who were in his classes and he cared about their salvation. And one day the Lord said, you need to go to where this young man in your class works. And he went to the shoe store where the young man worked. And he led that young man to faith right there in the store. And that young man's name was Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody was so compelled by the Spirit that he became a pastor and an evangelist. And he began spreading the good news of the gospel, not only in America, but across the pond in England as well. And so one day when he was at a small little chapel in England, he was sharing about the investment a Sunday school teacher had made in his life. And this message inspired the pastor of that small chapel, and his name was Frederick Meyer. And Pastor Meyer began doing his own revivals, and he ended up coming over to America and continuing to do them here. And he once said this at one of his revival meetings. He said, if you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? Well, that comment led a gentleman by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman to respond to the call of God in his life. And Chapman went on to become one of the greatest evangelists of his time. And at one of his revivals, there was a young man who was volunteering, who was there night in and night out, and kept hearing about God's grace that Chapman was sharing about. And this young man's name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday took over Chapman's ministry eventually and became an evangelical preacher himself, and he reached thousands of people. In 1924, Billy Sunday had a crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, where a group of people, young people, wanted to reach others for Christ. And one of those groups of young people decided, we need to bring somebody else in, in addition to Billy Sunday, and they brought this guy in by the name of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham, for several nights in a row, preached about God's grace, about God's call on the life of everyone who was there. And there was a lanky 16-year-old kid who was there every night and heard about God's grace from Mordecai. And that 16-year-old was Billy Graham. And we all know the late, great Billy Graham. May God rest his soul. Billy Graham went on to share the gospel to 215 million people in over 185 countries. But do you know where it started? It started with the Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball. Not a pastor, not a Christian educated man, a theologically educated man, but a Sunday school teacher who cared about the salvation of the kids in his class. Powerful stuff. I want to say this can be a little overwhelming, but I would encourage you to do this. Love a person. Find one person to pour into. Because you don't know what those ripples will do. And I've seen this in my own life 40-something years ago. There was a pastor at Fairfax Church named Doug Dillard. And Doug Dillard believed in a man named Doug Barracks to become the youth director of Fairfax Church. Lee knows Doug. Doug Barracks, not a theologically trained individual. Doug poured into generations of kids, including a young man by the name of Todd Furneaux. Todd ended up being a youth counselor at Fairfax. He met his wife there and eventually became a youth director on his own for 20-something years down in Tidewater in the Williamsburg area. Eventually, Todd, along with Doug and Abby Forrester and Barb Russell, all youth directors in Virginia, had a dream for a mission project. But there was middle school students were being ignored in mission projects. They created something called the Jeremiah Project in 1997. Three years on from that, Doug, who was back again at Fairfax in his second stint as youth director, 
took a group of middle schoolers on their first mission trip. Over the next several years, Doug and Todd poured into me and into countless others through things like Jeremiah Project. Of that initial group of campers, there were at least four United Methodist pastors who came out of that group, and many more youth directors and children's directors and other lay servants. That generation of kids grew up, and before we got into ministry, we, we staffed Jeremiah Project. And we poured into another generation of kids, and there's at least two United Methodist pastors that came out of that second group, along with many other volunteers and leaders. By my count, Jeremiah Project is on its fifth generation of young people who are now staffing and leading the next generation of young people and their adults. None of this would have happened. I would not be standing here today if Doug Dillard hadn't believed in Doug Barracks 40 years ago. And my hunch is that each of you have a story as well, where you have felt this ripple effect. This blessing giving life is part of the DNA of Buckhall Church. It's who we are. It's why for children we do things like VBS and Sunday school, and we dance and we act fools. It's why we take youth on mission trips and do crazy stuff at youth groups. It's why the men and women of Buckhall Church will answer the phone at 3 a.m. if you call them because someone's in need. It's why those who go through 12-step programs continually return and sponsor others and help them in their recovery. We will do anything short of sin to help point people to Jesus Christ. So who's that person you're pouring into? Think about their name. Write their name down. Now maybe you're not sure who that is. Maybe you don't have that person right now. Maybe there's a name that God will stir in your life. I want you to write that down. Contact them. Reach out to them. Build or rebuild that relationship with them. And maybe some of you are totally blank. You don't have anybody in your mind. Well, I have good news for you. There's 285,000 people in our immediate vicinity who don't know Jesus Christ. There are tens of thousands of children who've never been taught about the love of Jesus. Folks who need the guidance and mentorship of experienced Christians. If God is tugging on your heart to pour into that next generation, if He's pulling you in that direction, if He's stirring something in your soul, send me a text. Send me an email. Fill out an online connection card and put it in the notes section. And I'll call you. I'll email you. If I get 50 notes today, great. I will spend the first few days of my vacation making phone calls. It's that important. It matters that much. Because you never know what God can do with a wave or with a ripple. Friends, God has called us to transform this world. He's called us to keep the faith moving. Remember, in a decade, you're not going to remember who the Super Bowl MVP was. You're not going to know who won the Oscar. But in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years, in 80 years, you will remember the person that invested in you. And the person that you invest in. And the person that they invest in the people we leave a blessing with, they will remember. So friends, let's keep the faith moving. Let's pray. God, you are, God, you're so good. We give you praise and adoration for all the people who've invested in our lives, in our younger years and in our older years, who've made a difference in our lives who've transformed us and shaped us into who we are. Lord, we thank you for those people who are influencing our lives. Maybe it's sponsors, neighbors, family members, Sunday school teachers. God, we lift up the people who you are calling for us to reach out to, who you are calling for us to keep that ripple, that wave going. God, give us the strength and the courage to invest in the next generation. Help us to be people in a congregation that live into this wave effect and keep the faith moving. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we continue to pray, I, I lift up to you the prayer concerns that are in our weekly email. You can click on that if you go to the bulletin link. You can see that list. I also ask, Sue asked us to pray for her friend Linda, who is undergoing cancer treatment once again. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we lift up all the names that we have named. We lift up the names that are in our hearts. We lift them up to you, God. May you surround everyone in our prayers with your love. A healing hand for those who need it. A hand of peace and comfort for those who need it. God, you don't want us to ignore your dreams and hopes for us. God, you speak to us in what seems like riddles sometimes or parables. That we might pay attention to your words. You tell us story after story about our forefathers in the faith that we might become mentors to our children, our grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren. Father God, fill us with your generosity and with your grace. Help us to be ready to welcome Jesus into the, our lives and to be willing to open our hearts to those who are in need. Father God, on this day, we choose to serve you. We choose to serve our neighbors, our community. Together, Lord, we are the body of Christ. And we pray all these things in His precious name as we continue to pray the words that He taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to go our ways this morning, let us remember to look back, let us remember to look up, and look around. When courageous Christians take that cannonball dive into the ocean of God's grace, the waves never stop going. The ripples never stop going out. It just takes that little bit of courage to jump off the side and trust in God's grace. May we do that today, may we do that this week, and may we do that every day of our lives. Go in the grace and the peace and the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and with you all.